This is Lesson 26.2, Modernism in Architecture, Art, Literature, and Music. How did modernism revolutionize Western culture? College Board Topic 7.8, 19th Century Culture and Art. Explain the continuities and changes in European artistic expression from 1815 to 1914. And once again, we're going to go well beyond 1914. Modern art, including Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, and Cubism, moved beyond the representational to the subjective, abstract, and expressive, and often provoked audiences that believe that art should reflect shared and idealized values, including beauty and patriotism. The place is Europe. Time is about 1880 to about 1940. Key people in modernism in architecture, art, literature, and music. Frank Lloyd Wright, Claude Monet, Salvador Dali, Vincent van Gogh, Pablo Picasso, Mary Cassatt, and Franz Kafka. Key concepts of modernism in architecture, art, literature, and music. Modernism, Impressionism, Post-Impressionism, Cubism, Expressionism, and Surrealism. Intro. What does modernism entail? It entails, number one, constant experimentation to find new forms of expression. And number two, it entails anything that offers a challenge to traditional forms. And the striking freshness and originality of this period still marks the early 20th century as one of the great artistic eras. Architecture and Design It all started in the U.S. in the 1890s. The U.S. had no rigid architectural tradition of its own like Europe did. And this yielded freedom to experiment. The United States was experiencing massive urban growth. And Louis B. Sullivan opened the Chicago School. And that school built skyscrapers. And they used reinforced concrete, steel, and elevators. And they lacked exterior ornamentation. Frank Lloyd Wright. Frank Lloyd Wright designed radically modern houses. They had low lines open interiors, and mass-produced materials. And this was a huge inspiration to European designers. The new design principle was called functionalism. Buildings and homes should be functional. In other words, they should serve the purpose for which they were made, including no excessive ornamentation. Beauty is in the cleanness of the design. Straight lines, practical construction, efficient machinery. And this design's biggest proponent was Le Corbusier. A house, he said, is a machine for living in. Well, that's a very new and updated definition of what a house is. Buildings made according to functionalism were often called the international style. They had symmetrical rectangles. They were made of things like concrete, glass, and steel, products of the Industrial Revolution. In 1919, in Weimar, Germany, the Bauhaus School was founded. Its founder was Walter Gropius, and it was an interdisciplinary school. In other words, they incorporated painting, sculpture, printing, weaving, furniture, architecture, etc. And this school attracted students from the world over. Ludwig Mies van der Rohe became the Bauhaus director in the year 1930, and he moved to the U.S. to escape the Nazis in 1933. He designed the highly influential Lakeshore Apartments from 1948 to 1951. The New Artistic Movements For centuries, up until the 1870s, art had been about producing an accurate representation of reality. New movements challenged this objective. Let's get away from the figure and concentrate on the form. Things such as lines, shapes, colors, lighting. These movements spread all over the world, and they included painting and sculpture. Many of the artists were trained at institutions such as the Bauhaus. And these movements, as they followed each other, blazed a trajectory away from realism and towards abstraction. The first modernist movement was called Impressionism. It was big in Paris beginning in the 1870s. The idea of Impressionism was to portray sensory perceptions. 
Objects were the surrounding world rather than battles or religion or the wealthy. The movement of color and light was more important than representation. And so blurry, quickly painted images were more important than precision. You had to work fast before the impression changed or went away. Impressionism began this trend toward ever greater abstraction. There were three major Impressionist artists. Claude Monet, the haystack guy. Claude Monet didn't just do haystacks. Here's a modern train station. Let's think about what he's not doing. He's not nostalgically asking us to condemn its modernity like Romanticism does. And he's not asking us to just accept it so that we can improve society like Realism does. And he's not trying to create an exact representation of it. He's simply asking us to appreciate his impressions of the colors and light that he got in that moment. Edgar Degas, the ballerina's guy. And Mary Cassatt, the American woman in Paris. She painted new women. For example, here's her painting of this lady, and it's a woman presented in a new kind of context. She's sitting there with her glasses on, reading her paper in her seat, doing something for her own intellectual pursuits. There's no man in the picture, and she's not working in the kitchen sewing or doing anything like that. Post-Impressionism. This evolved about 1886 to 1905, and it was a reaction to Impressionism. It extended Impressionism in that it continued to use vivid colors, it applied thick paint, and it used real-life subject matter. But it also rejected Impressionism's limitations. Instead, it emphasized geometric forms, it distorted forms for expressive effect, and it used unnatural or arbitrary colors. The major post-Impressionist artists, Paul Cezanne, the father of post-Impressionism, and of course, Vincent van Gogh. Expressionism. This movement presented the world from a subjective perspective. It radically distorted the world for emotional effect. Expressionists sought to express emotional experience rather than physical reality. And Expressionism extended to a wide range of art forms. It was particularly well suited for films. Let's define Expressionism. It was an artistic movement that started in the late 1800s and peaked around the mid-1920s. Expressionism was found in painting, sculpture, literature, music, drama, and film. It was popular in both Europe and America, and of all of these artistic movements, Expressionism was used in film the most, and Germany was a major contributor to Expressionism on film. The idea behind Expressionism was this. Europe was becoming increasingly industrial. And Expressionism said machines, factories, cities, assembly lines, clocks, bells and whistles, etc. were robbing humans of their humanity. Our industrial society was distorting human beings by turning them into mindless, spiritless cogs in the machine. Some features of Expressionism impossibly uncomfortable furniture, windows with very odd shapes, people acting mechanically, strong shadows at weird angles, distorted architecture in bizarre ways, and distorted faces, partly with makeup. Remember, it's not the world itself that's supposed to be so distorted. It's actually the characters who are seeing it that way. In Expressionism, we are experiencing the world in the distorted way that the characters experience it, not as it necessarily is. Cubism. It was highly analytical. It used complex geometry. It used zigzagging lines and overlapping planes. Its biggest proponent was Pablo Picasso. Futurism. Futurism claimed that the human consciousness had been changed by technology. All movements from the past had to be discarded. A radical new set of art forms were necessary to express man's new technological reality. 
Futurism was pro-war, it was iconoclastic, and its focus on these things influenced fascism. The biggest proponent of futurism was Filippo Tommaso Marinetti. He wrote the Futurist Manifesto, and he wrote of glorifying war for its cleansing effect on society. He wrote of destroying museums, libraries, and academies because they were grounded in the past. And he wrote of scorn for woman. He later explained this scorn for woman idea by saying that he meant woman as an icon of cultural decadence, especially as represented by hypersexualized Italian poet Gabriel D'Annunzio. Dadaism. This movement emerged in Zurich, Switzerland in 1916 in the midst of World War I. And it argued that war had shown that life was meaningless and therefore art should also be meaningless. It should be outrageous. It should be shocking. It should be offensive. It should be anti-art. And it should attack familiar standards of art. Dadaism became worldwide once the war was over. Surrealism. This movement was deeply influenced by Freudian psychology. It portrayed images of the unconscious. Objects were precisely painted, but they were placed in fantastic worlds of wild dreamscapes. It had uncomfortable symbols, and it had irrational juxtaposition of images. Its biggest proponent was Salvador Dali. Modern artists believed that they were on a radical mission. They believed that they needed to call attention to society's failings, and they hoped to change the world. Many artists joined the far left, and when the Nazis came to power, many fled to the U.S., and as a result, New York replaced Paris and Berlin as centers of the art world. 20th century literature. Some of the things that mark 20th century literature are things that we are so used to that we wouldn't normally recognize them as distinctive 20th century literary developments. Yet we instinctively know when we are reading a 19th century novel and when we're reading a 20th century novel simply by that novel's character and tone. 20th century novels have such things as limited, confused viewpoints. The complexity and irrationality of the human mind is explored. And there's a jumbling of feelings, desires, and memories. The stream of consciousness is part of 20th century literature. You have your internal monologue. You have mentally disabled people. In 20th century literature, you have all the rejection of literary convention that goes along with a person's internal thinking, such things as bad grammar, scraps of knowledge, random memories, confusion, etc. Post-war despair. World War I affected literature deeply. There was an entire quote, lost generation of authors. What do we mean by lost generation? Many had lost friends in the war, and they explored worlds that were wasted and ruined. They explored feelings of confusion about a world that could be so incomprehensible. As 21st century readers, we are comfortable and we're familiar with these conventions. But at the beginning of the 20th century, they were relatively new and largely unexplored. Franz Kafka, who lived from 1883 to 1924, he was virtually unknown during his lifetime. And he's a perfect example of all of these early 20th century literary developments. Today, Franz Kafka is as high as you go in 20th century German literature. He is an undisputed literary giant. And he wasn't even German. He wrote in German, but his nationality was actually Czech. He was also Jewish. After he died of tuberculosis in 1924, his entire remaining family was wiped out in the Holocaust. Kafka's life. People often associate Franz Kafka with chronic sadness, melancholy, and isolation. And it's true that he felt isolated from his very dysfunctional family. His love life was also very messy and full of failure, and he was compulsive about a lot of things. But Franz Kafka also had a very positive life. He had lots of friends, he liked to play tennis, 
His favorite book was the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. He used to read it aloud at parties. And he had a law degree, hence the reason people often addressed him as Dr. Kafka. His employer, the company that he worked for, thought extremely highly of him, and he got regular promotions and raises. Kafka's writing. Kafka pioneered a new type of literary style. The word Kafkaesque refers to the kind of environment or situation that would remind you of a Franz Kafka story. So what is Kafkaesque? What's it like to be the hero of a Kafka story? The first thing you have is a spiraling staircase of paranoia and confusion. In Kafka's world, people don't often remember the things you, the protagonist, the hero of the story, saw them doing. When the main character tries to remind them of these things, they don't seem to know what he's talking about. They don't seem to know people he thought they knew. And the people seem very sincere about this. And the hero winds up feeling foolish and confused. And there's a cyclical quality to the paranoia and confusion. The hero of the story has an incomplete picture of everything. He doesn't know half of what is going on. However, everyone he talks to assumes that he knows far more than he does. So the hero never gets a full explanation of what's happening. People truncate their explanations to him and leave out vital information because they assume he already knows what they're leaving out. So he understands only half of what anybody's talking about. This incomplete picture is compounded by a lack of trust. The hero can never be sure of who anyone really is. He doesn't know who is for him and who's against him. And he's afraid to open up and reveal his ignorance to anyone because he doesn't know how they'll react. So he has to pretend to know more than he does. And if he does that well, it just confirms to the people around him that he's well informed. So it just becomes a vicious cycle of confusion fueled by paranoia. Then you have the extensive and enigmatic bureaucracy. Kafka himself spent his entire career working for a large workman's compensation firm. He received regular raises and promotions. When Kafka became too ill to work, this firm stood by him, giving him whatever he needed. But in his writing, Kafka depicted bureaucracy as a huge, enigmatic place without purpose. This book cover for his book, The Castle, showing a circular maze with no bottom to it, is a perfect visual for Kafka's view of bureaucracy, or a deep spiraling circle that leads nowhere. In Kafka's world, the organization seems to be much bigger and more pervasive than it needs to be. The authorities of the bureaucracy are enigmatic, no one really knows who's in charge of anything. You can never find the ultimate leaders because everybody's reporting to someone else. There's no scheme to it all that makes sense. There's no discernible chain of command. There's no hierarchy or pyramid structure. You feel like if you try to create a flowchart to track the flow of information and command, you just come up with a mess. There's no corporate goal or objective. The bureaucracy simply seems to exist for its own sake, like an organism that just keeps on growing. The work that people do doesn't seem to have any point to it. When you ask people what they do and how it contributes to the overall scheme of things, they can't tell you. So the whole thing just looks like nothing but a gigantic waste of manpower, effort, energy, time, and resources. Every bureaucracy must have a mini-tyrant. In any big enigmatic bureaucracy, there is a person with very little nominal authority who wields and abuses way more power than his or her position should give him. They use their power to the hilt, and this person has a unique understanding into this bureaucracy that no one else has. The mini-tyrant might have some specialized knowledge or access that no one else has, but that everyone else needs him for. Kafka was a master of both stream of consciousness and dialogue. He loved to create dialogue in which his characters said illogical things and then constantly corrected and adjusted themselves to accommodate their lack of making sense. My favorite quote was from the castle. I have such doubts, sometimes I doubt that I have doubts. 
His dialogue between characters was often very funny because of the competing agendas, illogical viewpoints, and paranoia. A big feature of his dialogue was constant attention to minutia. Characters would endlessly analyze exactly what important people may have meant by the most trivial word in a note or just by a passing gesture. Kafka's Detached Writing Style Kafka could write about things that were horrific. For example, Kafka's short story, The Penal Colony, was about a machine that the justice system employed to punish convicts. It slowly carved the person's sentence into his body over a period of 12 hours until the person died. But Kafka always wrote in an emotionally detached manner. His tone seemed to say, hey, I'm just relating the facts. I'm not telling you what to think or how to feel about these things. I won't judge them for you. I'm presenting them to you for you to judge. And this detachment often allowed Kafka to be horrific and funny at the same time. Modern music was also impacted by the violence and irrationality of the war. Music broke from tradition in ways that were similar to the ways that art and literature broke from tradition. The Russian ballet, The Rite of Spring, was so unconventional that it caused a riot when it opened in Paris in 1913. Sprechstimme became popular, and this was a blending of speaking and singing. It often came across as harsh singing. It was often very musically atonal. And the opera of the George Buchner play Wojciech was a good example. Austrian-born composer Arnold Schoenberg became famous for creating melodies out of randomly chosen notes from a chromatic scale. From this point on, be sure to check out the remaining slides that show examples of modern art that you should be familiar with.